Overcomers, uh, this is Renzi and uh, welcome back to uh, Connect Over Coffee. We have a very special guest with us today. His name is Dr. Mark Lewis and um, he is not just a physician, but he's also a cancer survivor and not so much, um, not in a phase that we see in our ovarian landscape very often, but that brings this element of a newness to, to our conversation as well. And Dr. Lewis is a the director of GI oncology at Intermountain Healthcare, and he was also at MD Anderson for several years before he moved to Utah. So, with that, uh, welcome, Dr. Lewis. It's a, it's such an honor to have you with us today. Well, thank you so much, Rinsey. And I, as I told you, I have such admiration for your organization. I'm thrilled to speak to your audience. Thank you. So, my first question: um, You are a patient physician, which means you bring that unique perspective to the table. Um, so please, please tell us about how your cancer diagnosis enhanced your experience as a physician and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. I, I guess I, I like the way that you hyphenated that because I'm always a patient first, right? And I sort of feel so privileged because I, you know, I, when I started my medical training, I actually didn't know that I had a hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, my father had died of cancer when I was 14, so that was the reason that I pursued the field. But it was only once I was actually starting my oncology fellowship that I realized that I also had a predisposition to cancer, and I found tumors then in my pancreas, which I later addressed surgically. So I think it's given me, um, I hope, um, authenticity and empathy. Um, you know, a lot of times when I'm making a decision with patients, and I think it's important that we phrase it that way, this is no longer paternalism, where I dictate what someone's going to do. It really is a dialogue and a shared experience, I hope. So it, it's not too much of a stretch for me to imagine what it would be like in their shoes. Now, for your audience, you know, I would never condescend to you know, understand what a woman with ovarian cancer is going through. But I do understand you know, being confronted with a serious and potentially life-threatening diagnosis. Um, I, too, even though I'm in the profession, experience sort of the initial shock uh, when I received my diagnosis, I, I call it the tinnitus of terror, meaning that when you hear that word cancer applied to you for the first time, it's really hard to hear anything else. Um, even when you're paying the closest attention, it just all kind of becomes this drone. And um, I, I've learned then to be careful in how I am um, sort of dispensing information, especially that initial consultation. I fully expect uh, that we'll have to sort of circle back and readdress some of those points that I'm making at later visits. So I know it's a long answer to your question. I, I guess the answer is, well, I would never put myself exactly on my patient's shoes. I think psychologically, I have some sense of what a profound impact this diagnosis has on you as a person. Thank you. And I was reading about um, some of the, um, the articles about you. Um, and so in one of your interviews, you said that there is no force in medicine more positive and powerful than the self-advocating patient. I love that, by the way. <laughs> and t tell us how you recommend our overcomers advocate for themselves and how can they become the strongest voices that they can be? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's so funny, um, so a couple of things there. First of all, if I hadn't advocated for myself, I wouldn't have actually reached my diagnosis or at least not as quickly as I did. So what happened was I sort of put the clues together. My very first week of my oncology fellowship, it, it all just came um, together in my mind. I had my eureka moment and I realized that I and my family had all the features of this germline mutation syndrome. And again, for your audience, you know, many of whom will have had to struggle with BRCA, um, you know, that was analogous in my family with MEN1. So I went to my doctor uh, that I'd been assigned at uh, the Mayo Clinic and I don't bear them any ill will, but they were extremely skeptical, and they thought I was a hypochondriac. And if I hadn't persisted, um, you know, politely but firmly, I don't think I'd have been worked up as quickly. Now, I realize, again, I have the, I suppose, advantage of um, having a doctorate and being in the field, and I do recognize that there's a power dynamic, whether we want to admit it or not, there's potentially a power dynamic between patients and physicians. However, we live in the information age, um, it's a relatively level playing field, paywalls notwithstanding, in terms of what information you can access online. And groups like yours, I think, do a fantastic job of empowering people with information. 
and directing them to reliable sources so they can come into their appointments and it's not just a one-sided you know exchange of information it truly is a conversation so the way i would encourage people to self-advocate is to learn as much as they want to um, about their own condition and also to be a little bit proactive in thinking about their treatment some of my patients still prefer that i call all the shots um, but of course that's something that they have to tell and, and defer to me the majority of my patients though really do like this exchange and i'll tell you uh Rinzi, one of my favorite things that happens is when a patient comes in and they tell me about a trial or even a treatment for their cancer i haven't heard of yet um, and then I sort of view it as my um, responsibility to either respond immediately or do my homework, usually the latter, and explore mm -hmm. whether that's right for that patient. But it's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, I'd say 90 plus percent of the time, you know, what they bring me is uh, relevant and um, interesting. And just in case it is in that minority where it falls into, say, misinformation or snake oil where someone's trying to take advantage of them, some sort of hoax, it's important that we talk about that too so they don't go down the wrong path so i guess i would just say you know patients should take advantage of this wealth of information that is available to them and then sort of use their uh, their doctor and organizations like yours to curate that information and this is so important because especially for ovarian cancer we hear so many patients because the symptoms are vague that yeah. they keep going to their primary care physicians or even their OBGYNs and yeah. you know they, they report those symptoms but not much comes out of it until they get diagnosed with cancer and go to specialists like you so this whole process and this whole journey there's a lot of advocacy that you have to do for yourself Right. to get eventually diagnosed and so it's so important what you say that you have to you know your own body and if you feel that something is not right and it's persisting you just need to keep pushing until you get an answer so that's exactly right and um one analogy i've heard there was this wonderful book written now over 10 years ago called how doctors think um, i think the author is dr jerome groupman and he makes this wonderful analogy about how difficult it is for a primary care physician, and my wife is one, um, catch a, an esoteric diagnosis, including cancer. And like you said, just like with my neuroendocrine tumors, which can have very vague symptoms, it'd be very difficult for ovarian cancer patients to reach a timely diagnosis. So his analogy was this. Imagine that the uh, primary care physician is standing at the side of a train track and the train's going by, that all the carriages are flashing by, and they have to pick the one face out in the window that is the sick person. Um, and I just thought that was such a wonderful way of realizing what their workflow is like. So again, without making them sound inattentive, you know, many primary care physicians are seeing you know, 30 patients a day, um, whereas patients, we inhabit our bodies 24 seven. So I completely agree with what you're saying. I think there's an appropriate degree of persistence and firmness. When you know something is wrong with your body, keep pushing. Um, until you get the answer that you find satisfactory. Thank you. Um, so as a patient physician, what is your advice and guidance to our overcomers as they navigate the challenges of COVID-19, which is now top of mind for everyone, yeah. in terms of you know, chemotherapy or surgery sessions that are potentially get, getting delayed or rescheduled for many patients? Right. So I'll try to make this uh, relevant to your audience, Rincy, I, I have sort of three groups in my practice, and I suspect most gynecologic oncologists do too. So first of all, I have the people that are through treatment, they're through surgery, through chemo, and they're now in survivorship. Mm -hmm. That's um, obviously a, a more favorable place to be right now. And actually, I'm doing almost all those visits the way I'm talking to you right now. So I think this is probably maybe the silver lining of this and I know we're not through the pandemic yet, is I think telehealth is going to become a lot more common afterwards. Um, I think we're realizing it's patient-centric. It just makes sense. And right now we're using it to medically distance ourselves from people who frankly don't need to be coming to the hospital. But then there's two other groups under my care that are a little trickier. So there are patients who have had their cancer surgically removed and are now considering adjuvant chemotherapy. I don't know if it's ever been harder really to determine the risk benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy because if your cancer has been cut out and you're contemplating sort of chemo as a future insurance policy to prevent the cancer from coming back, 
right now you really have to juggle, you know, is the long-term benefit of that worth the short-term risk? So what I would encourage your patients to do is ask their doctor what impact would the chemo or even the surgery, as you mentioned, have on the immune system? So particularly, it's the lymphocyte count that you want to worry about. So it's interesting. A lot of times when we give chemo, whether in my practice or in the gynecologic oncology practice, we're very focused on the neutrophils, the cells that fend off bacteria. But as it turns out, to get defense against viruses like the novel coronavirus, you really want to have your lymphocytes intact. And again, this is not uh, hard data to come by. Your doctor probably knows from your own complete blood count what your lymphocyte count looks like, even what it looks like over time. So that's definitely worth asking about. And the third group under my care, which is uh, um, heartbreaking, is people that have metastatic disease, where in my opinion, the risk of leaving their cancer untreated is actually greater than the risk of making them vulnerable to the virus. And in my practice, um, again, different than your audience, there's a lot of people, for instance, with pancreas cancer that has spread to the liver. And if I leave them off treatment for any substantial length of time, that disease can progress and become life-threatening in and of itself. So that's kind of the tricky balance. But again, it's not a decision that the patients have to make on their own. They really should make it in an informed way with their doctors. Absolutely. On the, uh, the trail of COVID-19 still, um, how should survivors as well as care partners uh, protect themselves during this COVID-19 challenges to visit the hospitals for their appointments and uh, what is your opinion? I know there's a lot of debate ongoing on the, on the usage of masks. Right. Um, should we try to make them at home because there's a dearth of them outside? And right. if so, why should we do that? Sure, yeah. So, so again, in terms of, um, I know no cancer appointment is ever elective, but there, if there's any way you can do your appointment the way you and I are talking right now, I think that's preferable. If you can avoid coming to a clinic or a hospital, that, let's be honest, might actually be a node of transmission for the virus, right, as patients congregate, you should stay away. And it's funny, a lot of people have interpreted, you know, empty or hospital parking lots as some sort of sign, this is all a hoax. It's no hoax. It's just that we've dramatically cut down on elective procedures and visits. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the mask question, you're right, it's being hotly debated right now whether it's worthwhile for civilians, uh, meaning people that are in healthcare, uh, to wear masks. I think the main advantage of it, frankly, is freeing up, you know, legitimate personal protective equipment for people that are in healthcare. Um, that might be the greatest advantage that's immediately evident to me, but I will say, if you're going out and about, it's important to remember, because we all still have to go to the grocery store, or most of us do, that the way this is transmitted um, is respiratory droplets. So if you're here in the hospital and we are, heaven forbid, having to intubate you, so put you in a ventilator, that's actually a high-risk procedure for us because that's a process of aerosolization where these tiny sort of microparticles go into the air and they stay there for a very long time. But short of that, um, the virus is really spread by, by coughing and sneezing. So um, the, the mask over your face, in theory, uh, can protect you uh, or others from that happening. The, the, the trick though, Rincy, is um, most of the homemade masks, and my wife and I have even figured out how to make some masks ourselves, um, probably don't uh, have the ability to filter out the coronavirus particles. So a coronavirus particle is 0.1 microns, and most of the things that you can get at home need to get down to 0.3 microns. So still very, very small, but three times um, the, the width of the virus. So I think that's where people are getting a little bit of mixed messages, and it is confusing right now what you should wear and when. Uh, my bottom line is if you can avoid, uh, and I know this sounds maybe selfish on our part, but if you can avoid purchasing masks that could otherwise go to healthcare professionals like our poor colleagues in New York, um, I think that's almost an ethical responsibility to do that. Correct. In terms of, you know, I know I've, um this is off the track, but I, I'm just going to ask you anyways, because I've heard, I've seen a lot of nonprofit organizations and others that are coming forward to make masks for um, the physicians and the healthcare professionals as well as for themselves. So my question is, it, are those the right kind of masks that the doctors actually need or? 
Well, I would say in some cases, unfortunately, you know, supplies are so scarce of, you know, the, the actual manufactured equipment that it's a case of something being better than nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I think the real sort of red flag was a couple of weeks ago, I think two weeks ago now, the Centers for Disease Control declared sort of a crisis state and said that, you know, if you have nothing else to wear and you're a healthcare worker, put on a bandana or a scarf. That was almost a verbatim quote. Mm -hmm. And that shows you just how far we've gone from our normal standards. Um, I'll also say to your question, it is so heartwarming um, to see people across the country donating equipment to uh, medical professionals. I would caution people to realize that there are differences by institution. So for instance, I work at Intermountain Healthcare in here in Utah. My employer is currently discouraged um, using homemade equipment, largely because we're relatively fortunate and our supply chain of actual equipment is pretty good. But these things will change in, or could change in the weeks to come. So it's kind of a moving target. Um, through um, organizations like yours and specifically through social media platforms like Twitter, you know, doctors and nurses are, are actually putting out calls for equipment where and when they need it. So mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of um, uh, noise to kind of work through, but there are signals there of people that legitimately need this equipment. Okay. This is not a COVID-19 question. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, regardless of cancer type, uh, please tell us your thoughts on why it is important to know about family history um, and genetic risk when it comes to cancer diagnosis and what are some of the, uh, some of the things women and men um, can do to reduce their risk in such a setting. Like sure. a so, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so sentimentally, this question means a lot to me because my father and my paternal grandfather and my paternal uncle all went to their grave, not actually knowing what was wrong with them. Um, they all had uh, cancers or tumors of various types. Um, as it happens, they were all uh, teetotal ministers, so their lifestyle was very clean. Um, and they could never really figure out, you know, why me? Um, and so that, you know, obviously troubles and saddens me that they didn't know the reason for their disease. And I think there was even some, you know, shame and stigma about it, uh, which, again, I wish I could unburden them of that guilt. But the real medical answer to your question is what I call the tip of the iceberg phenomenon. So when you find someone who for the first time in their family is identified as having a genetic syndrome, you know, you can work through their siblings, you can work up through their parents and grandparents and down to their children and, and find and potentially protect so many others. Uh, you know, I live and work here in Utah where the average family size is quite large. And so uh, that founder effect here is really, really profound. Um, so I think it's an opportunity not just to protect the person in front of you, uh, but to really think about the ripple effect it can have on these, on these families. And it's funny, I was just thinking as we were talking, probably the, in the Venn diagram of my practice and your patient population, you know, BRCA is in the overlap um, right. as potentially driver mutation for pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. So the other thing I would say to folks is when you're taking or giving your family history, give as much detail as possible. In fact, I don't think there's such a thing as too much detail. Um, so if you know that a relative had cancer, to the best of your ability, tell the doctor what type of cancer it was, meaning where did it start, and at what age was that person affected. And these are the kind of patterns that really, really help us. Um, and it's tough because, you know, even a few generations ago, again, there was such a, um, a shame associated with cancer that people didn't talk about it. Uh, I believe in the, up until the 1960s, I don't think the New York Times would even print the phrase breast cancer. Um, so it's tough to get that, that granularity. But if, if you know the details, share them with your doctor. The, the last thing I'll say is you may only get one shot at that. And I know that sounds scary, but it is so common these days that the family history is only taken at the first appointment and then never again. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, also a dirty little secret that in our electronic medical records, that first family history you give tends to get propagated through copying and pasting. So again, I know the first visit, there's lots to talk about, unfortunately, but family history is very important to relay. And also, I think, you know, it's important to understand that these, I'm not a doctor, but I, from what I read and all the advisors that we have, um, it's also important because it, it impacts your own treatment these days with the PARP inhibitors and um, other treatments out in the market. It's not just you, not just your family members. At this point, it directly impacts you. 
right. and your right. treatment path, right? So exactly. Yeah. So my last question, um, I know uh, we have uh, limited time, so please share something positive with our listeners and tell us what would be your parting message for our survivors and overcomers, not just for today, but just going forward in the, into the future. Well, I would say I know things look dark right now um, with the pandemic, but we will get through this um, just as we've gotten through other cha other challenges. Um, I would say I think I'll end on a hopeful note in regards to oncology. So, I, I, again, I got into this field because my father was diagnosed in the late 80s, died in the early 90s of his cancer, and his treatment was brutal. Um, all the sort of you know, classic stereotypes about chemotherapy were true. He lost his hair. He was horribly nauseous. His immune system was decimated, and frankly, it didn't work very well. Um, now, you know, if I was to treat my dad now, um, which is kind of a, a thought exercise, um, his treatment would be so much more tolerable and effective. And just in my not very long career, I've seen certain diseases that normally would have been a death sentence, like malignant uh, metastatic melanoma, uh, becoming potentially curable um, through immune therapy. It's amazing. Um, I literally wrote an article about, you know, when I was in fellowship not too long ago, you know, if you came in with stage four melanoma, we had a very serious talk and I did not have very many treatments that were effective and tolerable. And now, you know, Jimmy Carter is alive in his, I think now late nineties or mid nineties with melanoma that went to his liver and his brain. I mean, it's, it's incredible and he's on immunotherapy. So we're making advances all the time. Um, obviously we're going to focus in the short term on getting all of our patients through the pandemic. Uh, but then after that, you know, it's all systems go. And we'll be focused on cancer research again. Thank you so very much, Dr. Lewis, for your time. This was a fantastic conversation. And overcomers, make sure that you um, share this brilliant information by Dr. Lewis onto your social platform so more people can benefit from it. And we'll be back soon with the next, uh, next uh, coffee, Connect Over Coffee. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you.